So for those of uh, you who are new to the DEFI webinar series, uh, we have an ongoing um, webinar series specifically, uh, I've done today particularly powered by ARM because we're powering the steam train, but they are actually sponsored by ARM uh, and we're very grateful for that. And what we'd like everyone to do is to introduce themselves into the chat. We will be recording this and it is also live streamed. Um, you are more than welcome to message um, everybody in the chat. And you can also uh, message any questions, use the, Q the Q and A or anything specifically to the hosts and the panelists. We do welcome a dialogue um, within our chat facilities. So my name is Genevieve Smith Nunes. I'm a PhD candidate here at Cambridge, um, studying creative computer science and data ethics. And welcome to DEFI, the Digital Education Futures Initiative here at Hughes Hall. So what we'd like to start with is uh, letting you know where you can sign up for any more of our wonderful uh, series and also available on our past recordings on our YouTube channel. It's available here. And again, this series of webinars are sponsored by ARM. Um, just to show you the format today, we have five wonderful and diverse speakers today. Um, if you want to pose a question, please use the Q&A facility. Again, the chat is uh, available and open to anyone. And we, if you want to use Twitter, so if you could actually just at us in there as well, which is defi underscore Cambridge. And let's get started. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists today. And we have five amazing speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Bernard, and she is the Professor of Arts and Creativities here at Cambridge University. And she is um, the chair of the Arts and Creativities Research Group, she, which runs online uh, monthly sem seminars called Performing Research. She is widely published with over 20 books and hundreds of articles, which advance the theory of multiple creativities across the education sectors, including early years, primary, secondary, further and higher education, through to creative and cultural industries. And she's also the co-editor of the journal Thinking Skills and Creativity. She's a fellow um, as well. And what we'd like to do here is um, introduce Pam and hand over the talk to her and she will be starting off our seminars. So I hand over to Pam. Thank you so much. It's a great privilege to join you tonight. And with 10 minutes, uh, I can only say this is a snapshot of which several times I'll say to Genevieve, place a, a URL or an article into chat, which will elaborate for you to read at a later stage. So thank you so much for the invite. I'm going to be troubling a lot of things. So put your seatbelts on, have your floaters on and, and get ready for a disruption, I hope. Please, next slide. This is an overview of, you know, the key, the next slide, please. Uh, this is an overview of, you know, really the historical view, the incarnations of STEM, which of course has been, you know, on the agenda for, for 20, 30 years, looking at, trying to get at this, how do we avoid siloed teaching? The, the, the getting a more constellation of, of disciplines together, very good for the economy, very good for the skills gap, but actually not, uh, not taken up by students as, as people would have hoped. The subsequent shifting of focus from STEM to STEAM first done actually and, and voiced and mobilized by George Yaxman in the US, who was the creator of STEAM education, looking to integrate uh, all of these subjects through problem solving learning. Well, you know, fantastic start, but there's been many problems. So the Beer Commission report, which I'd ask you to put in a summary into the chat in, is, is something that was uh, funded uh, for us to do a review and to of STEM to STEAM. And of course, STEM as well as STEAM retains it. No, no, same, no, back, haven't moved yet. Uh, 
retains its lack of educational clarity. It's very unclear what STEAM actually means, what it does, how you do it. Is it arts infused teaching? Is it arts integrated teaching and if you're an arts teacher you just don't want to be the handmaiden to every other subject so the Beera commission really does a 300 page in-depth dive into the literature on these issues of science stem education science and arts education and looking at the limits and possibilities of locating and repositioning STEAM approaches, and I urge you to have a look at that uh, report. The fourth thing is to dismantle these tired old binaries of theory, practice, body, mind, body, brain, self, other, science, arts, nature, culture, is a key element in relation to future making education and developing new knowledge pathways in a radically generative future making way. And so troubling the unsettling terrain of these dominant discourses of disciplines is really what this whole session is about. Next slide, please. And so if we were, next slide, please, to look at transdisciplinarity, which is where we've moved to in thinking STEM to STEAM, STEAM education, now we're moving to transdisciplinarity and transdisciplinary education. A couple of definitions are here. One is by Sanford. She speaks about the methods that transgress transdisciplinary boundaries. Think about your own practice as a researcher, as a teacher, as an artist, as a mum, as a dad, you know, as a learner. How do you transgress transdisciplinary boundaries that you do every time you touch and work with one of these beauties? You know, this is what uh, we're working with a lot. But in education, it's being slow to translate. And so looking at transdisciplinarity is a starting point for the, you know, knowing, knowing how to transcend disciplinary boundaries and being the ontology of that practice is what we're looking at. Next slide, please. So in thinking about all of this, Oh, is that a gorgeous slide? Lines of flight, looking at the way we can think differently, sort of performative departures, let's say that, you know, in terms of the intra-action, the assemblage, the, uh, the, the in-between us, the spaces in between disciplines and how pedagogies might look in relation to math, art, science, geography, music, science. You know, this is not new. Uh, da Vinci, of course, was the most extraordinary polymath. And I'm advocating that we should be educating da Vinci thinkers, children as da Vinci thinkers. And if we go to the next slide, please, thinking differently about education, challenging that which we thought we had already rethought is what it is to be human, to continue to learn, to grow, to be uh, 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 much more about future making rather than future ready as educators. Taking the relationality between human, non-human, of course, technology is central to this and the more than human as a starting point and challenging universal humanism and exceptionalism taking decentering the human and acknowledging that there are others on the stage actually working very hard to engage us as humans in and non-humans and more than humans on this planet that needs new answers and new solutions to problems we can do that through education so thinking differently about education thinking differently about the profession. Next slide, please. What does this actually mean? Here are three slide, three books, and I'm not trying to self-promote, but I've only got an, a, a, a three minutes left to say in those three books, you'll find teachers working with uh, researchers who are doing transdisciplinary education and really disrupting practices, looking at how sciences and arts meet and perform together reconfiguring uh, and looking at reconfigurations of classroom practice 
assessment and education generally. Next slide, please. So if we start and just have a little look at a few examples, what mathematics and visual art teach together, if you wouldn't mind putting into the chat room, please, uh, the, the article which has the name of this talk, uh, which will explain in much more detail all of these images and these ideas and these big words. If I've used, used big words, I'm sorry, uh, I, it, it, it's, it's part of the academia, you know, that makes you sort of um, rethink and conceptualize complexities can take you into three and four and five syllable words, uh, uh, in, indeed even four worded uh, uh, concepts which does freak us all out from time to time. But this, really this, the simplicity of, of what does appear really complex is, can be complex and it is, but the simplicity of the practice is seen in these artworks. We analyzed 200 of them from South Africa. We now have another 200 that have just come in from South African high schools and another 200 from Indian uh, schools. So we're looking at this meeting of mathematics and visual art when we ask students to, to draw their understanding of mathematics and visual art. And we get to see their knowing, their doing, and their being as 16 and 14 year olds. Next slide, please. And so we see here a young 16 year old who really inscribes mathematics on his body as he called this the stressed Vitruvian man, of course, it's a big nod to da Vinci himself. But you see the identity, the meaning making, the struggle, uh, but expressed through art. Next slide, please. And here we see the infinity of a young girl's view of mathematics uh, 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 attached to the metaphor of her hair. So much more can be said. And if you read the article, you'll see more. Next slide, please. So in a sense, looking at what music and science teach together. If you just look at the materiality of these hands, these hands, the material making, the making with and the making of and the material discursive entanglement. Yeah, it is messy, really looks, uh, and you see the sort of deterritorializing, the sort of de-siloing of music being taught as in and through science. Next slide, please. Here we have a Scottish, what's called steam garden, and they do a lot more than just grow an outdoor garden. This, this, this is an outdoor classroom that is actually teaching with the issues of climate change, sustainability issues in the making that define our lives. Next slide, please. And so we come to using sonic pine, technology, the materiality, the making with the matter, of computer science, live coding, music, composition, performance. They teach together when they're taught as a transdisciplinary subject. Next slide. And so we come to next steps. We need to reposition arts and sciences, not as alternatives, but as belonging together to teach collaboratively with interprofessional partnerships and to really dismantle the structures that are currently denying a turn in future making education. Next slide, which is a big thank you. Thanks, Pam, for kicking off our steam train at full throttle. I wouldn't expect anything less. Um, it's really fascinating. And we all have different views of how we've used STEAM or whatever acronym you wish to use. Um, and for me, it's um, very much what Pam was saying. It's about this dematerializing the silos and breaking down these actual kind of compartmentalizations of domains, fields, people's expertise, methodological approaches. Um, so for me, I kind of see it as an ontological kaleidoscope that we can turn these lenses of each of these different domains and fields and create new patterns, new knowings, new ways of being, new ways of understanding. Um, and um, there is no kind of one way to go um this is why it's actually like a journey and talking of that journey we're about to board the train again and go to our next destination which is the fabulous 
Karen Alexander. So if you bear with me a moment. Um, so Dr. Karen Alexander is the founder of XR Connected. She is based in Pittsburgh in the US and we welcome her for joining us across the little pond. Um, so XR Connected provides strategic consulting on XR adoption. So what we mean by XR is, um, so under the um, XR umbrella is many things um, that are there from AR, VR, um, haptics and 4D and many more things. Um, educational program development, immersive media production. Karen is an educator, community builder and is inspired by ingenuity and believes the purpose of technology is to empower people to improve lives. She is a member of the Immersive Learning research network um, which is a an amazing research network and i would check it out it's super friendly and there is amazing resources there for you too as well to expand your knowledge and she is the founder of xr women and she's currently working with a virtual dance exchange project in which dance companies explore for, uh, choreography for 3D um, for, uh, video and other creative possibilities. And she also received her PhD in English literature from University College London. We're just crossing over all of these networks. It's so cool. So I'm going to hand over to Karen and um, let's all go on our next stop. First, I'll unmute and then I will share my screen. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. And um, I, I, you know, you mentioned, Genevieve, that I went to, uh, that I did my PhD at University College London. And um, this, uh, my supervisors there were David Trotter and Kasia Badi, who um, subsequently, or, or before I finished, even left for Cambridge. And uh, my daughter at the time uh, attended Parliament Hill School for Girls. And I see there are a lot of educators from uh, Camden uh, present here today. So that is very exciting as well. And um, I met Genevieve through the Immersive Learning Research Network, and we, um, at XR Women made an award to her um, for her innovative research uh, earlier this year. And uh, yeah, so, so very happy to be here uh, with you all today. Um, so uh, how did I get here in my, I'm very much immersed in the XR space. So XR technologies covering virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and 360 degree videos. I came to that from a um, doing a PhD in English. Um, I won't go into all of that for now, um, but I do live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which I think is quite a beautiful and striking city. It is a Rust Belt town. Um, it really suffered from the decline of the steel industry and hasn't quite recovered yet, but there are signs that it is recovering. As I said, it's a very visually striking striking place um, and I love the rivers and the the hills and the lush green trees here. Um, and uh, there are some very opulent institutions here that were founded based on steel money and steel money does still contribute to the arts. Um, but the new driver of the economy uh, the up and coming one is robotics. Um, we have the advanced robotics for manufacture here, uh, companies like Astrobotic, which um, is a lunar logistics company and works with robotics um, for, uh, for travel to the moon. And the Pittsburgh Robotics Network now has 100 members. Um, so that would give you that will give you a sense of how much the robotics industry is thriving here. So this is where this is the new driver of the economy in Pittsburgh, or or, so, or soon will be. Um, there are also some institutions related to what I do. There is the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University, 
And um, that's in the picture on the left, that's um, part of their space, which is super, super cool. Um, and then at the top right, you see, I'm not sure if that's the Muggsy or the Socioptican, but Facebook Reality Labs has, a, uh, has an institution here and they are doing research on photorealistic telepresence. Uh, they're a bit secretive and um, don't necessarily interact with the local community much. And then there is um, Shell Games, which is a the largest independent gaming company in the U.S. and they make some brilliant uh, VR games, including one called I Expect You to Die, the second edition of which just came out. Um, and Pittsburgh get, it keeps getting these uh, accolades and named as one of the most livable cities in the U.S., one of the best places to live in the U.S. But at the same time, um, for some people, it's the worst place. Uh, I think you can see that there's a strong sense that for Black women, it is not a good place to be at all. So this points up some of the disparities that are here in the city and the inequities. There are some stark racial divides here. Um, and so, you know, this raises the question, who is benefiting from the robotics industry and um, who, who does it serve and who can participate in robotics and working in robotics? There is a strong maker culture in Pittsburgh and there have been efforts to sort of create pathways from learning and maker spaces to jobs and manufacturing because there's also a massive shorter shortage of workers in manufacturing right now and that's not just a problem here in pittsburgh or in the us but it's but it's global it's a, it's a worldwide problem and so there are a lot of efforts to kind of um, channel children into manufacturing through maker spaces um, and there are 250 maker spaces in the Southwest Pennsylvania region. Here are some in the Pittsburgh, just in the Pittsburgh area on a map there. Um, one maker space that I have worked with that explicitly focuses on STEM is one called Assemble. And I, I Pam said uh, something about things being messy. And I think this is a good example of messiness. Um, this is from a, a program that I led there last year um, that was called Hack the Future uh, for teens. And um, I, I worked with Hack the Future for a couple of years. Um, and uh, this is a, another picture of what we did there. And I really encouraged the students to use their creativity to engage with XR tools there. I, so when I came to Pittsburgh, um, I was inspired by the idea through my, my study of uh, feminist art and women's documentary filmmaking, uh, about the idea that that the advent of the video camera made it possible for more women to tell their stories and the stories of other women when these consumer grade 360 degree cameras became available and i bought my, one myself right away and felt very empowered by that so when i came to pittsburgh in 2017 i formed this program pgh and 360 youth perspectives and um, worked with some local organizations to teach teens how to create 360 degree videos about issues that mattered to them. Uh, these organizations included One Hood Media and uh, The Lighthouse Project, uh, among others. And I also worked with ACH Clear Pathways, which is uh, located in the Hill District, um, right on top of the hill, like right above the Strip District, which is now known as Robotics Row. And uh, it is a almost entirely black neighborhood um, and a, a quite a poor one. So um, in thinking again about who, who's going to go into the jobs in robotics, which of course require some specialized skills and training that the local schools do not necessarily prepare children for. Um, so I worked with ACH Clear Pathways, an after school arts program with, with young children uh, teaching them to create 3D worlds and stories using a tool that some of you may be familiar with called CoSpaces and also the Merge Cube. 
Um, and uh, it was really inspiring to see what they created and they would get so excited uh, ab about what they were working on here. But they were, there was a lot of uh, learning going on that was beyond arts. They were just excited to create these things, to make their stories and their worlds. But um, this is this is the larger list of things that um, uh, uh, learning outcomes that I came up with, but I've broken that down and made it a little more digestible here. And um, to give you an example of uh, a couple of these, there was one girl who was seven years old who was in her in her little environment that she had created. She wanted to make a car go a certain way. And so she had to figure out the relationship between how far it was going and how fast it was moving. So it needed to go, she needed to make it go so many meters in so many seconds. And then she had it stop at a crosswalk and a woman walked across the street. And then it, then it had to turn a corner and she had to understand that to turn that corner, she had to um, make it go rotate uh, 90 degrees. Um, so, um, and these are some of the other sorts of things that children were learning there. Uh, CoSpaces uses code blocks, so coding blocks. So they were also doing some coding as well. Um, and so one thing I'll, I'll say before going on to this slide is that um, among all the organizations, the community organizations I've worked with who um, serve children and youth, especially those who are underserved, they have a keen awareness of what their children are missing and they are really excited to have the opportunity for their children to start learning about how to use new technologies because these kids are not getting it in their schools uh, some are in in some parts of town but um, the kids these organizations serve are not so this is these are images from my current project uh, virtual dance the virtual dance exchange project in which i'm working with um three choreographers and we filmed um just you know over the last month um three dances that were choreographed for 360. the one on the left that location is called mill 19 and it's um a, it was built in the husk of an old mill for the steel industry and the nearby community of hazelwood uh, the people who lived there you know, worked there. Now that's where Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing is is located. Uh, Carnegie Mellon has a um, has a presence there, and Catalyst Connection, which is a manufacturing extension partnership. But none of these places are employing people in Hazelwood uh, from that area. Um, so that's the you know sort of the context for that location. Uh, the bottom right, this is um, the borough of Wilkinsburg, just outside Pittsburgh, um, effectively part of the city. And uh, Chrysalis Brown choreographed a, a dance and had musicians um, from Guinea performing, so doing a traditional um, dance from Guinea for her 360 video. And then at the top, Shana Simmons dance. Um, did a performance in a dilapidated church, um, also in Wilkinsburg. Um, let's see, so here is a little bit more information about VDEP. We have not released those videos yet, but I encourage you to follow us and look for those. We'll have a launch event on October 1st, and we're also staging some public dialogues as part of this project to address the racial divides in the dance community and the relationship between tech and the arts here locally. Um, oh, all right, <laughs> there, I forgot that this was was animated. Um, so that is me. I'll, I'll just mention briefly one other thing that I'm working on that some of you might be interested in. Um, I'm one of the organizers and producers for the WebXR events series. Um, and we have a business summit, WebXR for Business Summit coming up on September 14th and on October 12th um the webxr design summit um so i don't see the rest of my text there oh there it goes i have to press the button to go on uh there's the information about xr women we meet every wednesday in the verbella platform would love for some of you to join us thank you very much thank you karen <laughs>
so exciting. I mean, it's so amazing. I obviously I'm a little bit of a dance fan, so obviously uh -huh. <laughs> totally enjoying that bit. Um, but actually, it's really interesting the kind of industrial areas and and the sort of um, dichotomy between all of these businesses coming in and providing these amazing opportunities, but actually they don't end up being localized. Um, and I think that's a really big thing where we can actually um, play a role between education and industry. And, um, and also uh, the phases of education can actually bring this like cross uh, development in. So that's really quite exciting. Um, and without further ado, we're gonna jump aboard again. And, uh, but this time, we're going to um, join our next speaker, which is Dr. Carter, and he's a program convener and senior lecturer in digital media at the University of Roehampton. And Richard's research interests are um, questioning and examining the issues concerning the more than human agency within digital arts and literature, considering how these generate insight into the uh, what it means um, to perceive, to articulate and to act within the, um, the world. Uh, Richard's uh, research is embedded in his artistic practice, which is super interesting and lots of uh, he's going to go through that with you. Um, but he's really looking at the development of art objects that mediate the potentialities of sensing, knowing, writing, and the intersection between human and mechanistic actors. So I'm going to have hand over to Richard. Hello there. Right. So let me just uh, share my slides with you all now. So if I just go ahead and do that. Can you see everything all nicely? I hope you can. Let me it's know otherwise. still on... Is it on my desktop, is it? <laughs> it's still on not full screen yet. Okay, well, let me uh, let me try that now. Can you see? Perfect, it? absolutely perfect. Me? Good. Okay, because I'm using I'm using a two screen setup here, so it's always slightly uh, yeah, it's always slightly concerning that you're seeing one thing and the other. Okay, everyone, hello and thank you so much uh, for coming along today and for inviting me along to speak. It's a, it's a real privilege. So as Genevieve said, I'm senior lecturer in digital media at the University of Roehampton. I teach on the digital media program, and my talk today ultimately is coming from a higher education standpoint where I think the ties between the lecturers own research and their immediate pedagogy are often really quite explicit so this is where I'm coming from today. As a researcher in my field I'm perhaps somewhat unusual in that I'm also a practicing artist and I invariably combine these two elements as an aspect of what I do on the daily basis. And so therefore in some respects this offers what I hope is one potential instance of what transdisciplinary STEAM might begin to resemble in practice. So to explain my research a little further and how this feeds into my pedagogy, I can start by saying that I'm most interested, as Genevieve alluded to, in questions about how we measure, map, explore, articulate, and act on a more than human world through technology. What do these systems allow us to know, but also what they don't know? what they don't capture as well, what is lost when we read the world through a rigidly disciplined technical frame. As part of this, I'm interested in thinking of other ways of rendering digital information algorithms beyond their usual depictions of sequences of numbers and code. And so the way I do my research then, and to explore answers to these issues and questions is often through my artistic practice. Yes, I hit the books, I do a lot of conventional scholarly work beforehand, but what I then do is I use these to learn to create digital artworks that in the process of making them help me better understand the technology and its potentials, rather than theorizing these ideas in the abstract. So here the themes and ideas found in the scholarly work act as a catalyst for more experimental speculative creations. And I want to stress that the key value of doing this is not the actual creative outcomes. I believe it or not, I don't make art for the sake of making artworks as such, but instead what I find most valuable are those interactive processes involved. The technologies, concepts and writings that are brought together in combinations that they don't often appear in or indeed at all. And so from this, the lines of flight that are drawn between them, the hypotheses that are reworked and the assumptions that are denaturalized in the process of reworking them. 
We might characterize this as a mangle of practice between technologies, concepts, and disciplines. When things come together, break down, and produce unexpected conjunctions of possibility and insight. Those are the things which I find most exciting and insightful. So to illustrate very, very quickly what it is that I do in uh, concrete terms, I have very little time to do this. This is going to be a very elementary sketch indeed. This is a still from a series of works called Orbital Reveries. And what it involves is Landsat satellite imagery, machine vision algorithms, and works of ecological nature writing. And they're drawn together to produce these sort of generative compositions. So initially you have the satellite scene, it's scanned by a machine vision algorithm into these different shaded regions that you can see. And the data that is contained within those regions is then put through another algorithm that uses them to generate these kinds of text, generative textual maps of the scene. And again, these, the words that are, are mapped out onto the scene here are drawn from geographical dictionaries. They are drawn from works of nature writing. They are drawn from works of critical reflection on satellite topography and satellite sensing. So we have here this slightly wild conjunction of different systems, different ideas, different concepts, technologies that are all brought together. And what they ultimately do is they, they shed light and how we work to respectively sense and make sense of a rapidly changing world, of the relationships between these different techniques of seeing and understanding, and of the potentials between their particular relationships, of how they, of their differences, what they respectively see that the other doesn't, but how they can then work together to allow us to better understand what is taking place, and appreciate not just their scientific dimensions, but also their effective impacts on our sense of self, of our shared collectives and how we respond as human beings to a profoundly damaged more than human world. There's a lot more that I could say here, but we'll just leave it as that. Another really quick instance. Uh, these two instances are drawn from a series called Logic Gardens. Believe it or not, these are not pictures. This is actually code. You can run these compositions through a particular kind of interpreter and they will generate working functional outputs. They belong to a class of work called esoteric coding languages. And like all esoteric coding languages, they make us think about the nature of how we speak to computers and how computers in turn are rendered tractable to us. How do we make their infernally invisible, difficult processes tractable? And moreover, in the way that we speak to computers, how can we imagine different possibilities for doing so? And how if in the process might that make us think about different possibilities for computing more generally? And what would the cultural impacts be of a world in which we speak to computers through shapes and colors, rather than just the usual sort of English language of binary logical constructs? It's very speculative, but nevertheless, I think it's a very interesting way of rethinking what, what is a computer? What does it do? How do we talk to it? And how does it talk to us? So in showing you all these works then, and they do sort of, they all do lots of various works and they actually are trying to speak beyond their status as digital artworks. They're trying to make us think about the world more generally. But nevertheless, whenever I present these works in public, a very common reaction is to dump all of that. We're not interested in that. They're read instead as demonstrators of AI technology. They, by academics and the public alike, they are invariably boiled down to, this is a technical demonstrator. And this is another demonstrator how AI is going to erase human agency, take our jobs and get rid of artists. It's a very common reaction. I often now have to have a preface it to try to preclude because it's such a common reaction. It's very hard to steer the conversation away from the notion of them being purely a technical demonstrator or indeed the latest form of digital pipes, just non-fungible tokens or something. I think this is very revealing of how digital technology is broadly framed and understood. And so they has a value in itself in making us think through these things. And it's also nevertheless a complicating factor that has to be negotiated continually. It invokes perennial challenges of verbalizing artworks academically and publicly. So it's in thinking through this AI problem to try to think about digital art as doing things other than talking about its own status as a digital artwork that a lot of my pedagogy has started to sort of respond to and emerge from. 
So one of the things that I do at Roehampton is a module called Digital Storytelling. And at one level, yes, it's about how can we tell stories using inter the tools of the four modes of interactivity afforded to us by digital tools and systems. But it's, a lot, it's about a lot more than that. It's about getting students to rethink what they understand digital technologies to be and what they are ostensibly for, to get them thinking that they, are, they can be used for things other than for a very particular purpose. How else can we use them? What are their other potentials of expression? And how can we use those potentials of expression to talk about issues other than, isn't this a cool piece of technology? So what I do is in this module, I give students a potted history of digital art, digital creativity, so they are aware of what's gone before, and there's a very long history indeed, and then get them to think about what, how we might take those lessons to the past and how we might take them forward. And what I do is I give them a mixture of templates that are kind of predefined, that give them some initial tools for starting to produce their own stories. Many of them are broadly modelled on things we've all encountered before in either in the world of gaming or indeed in the very lowest tiers of AI research. But nevertheless, what I then try to get the students to do is to use those templates and tools to do something other than make a game or make a new kind of chatbot. What if we made a chatbot that's not about you know, trying to sell you something or trying to you know, sort out issues with your gas bill, but is instead about presenting a personality, which is strange and unusual. It's not just something that you might have encountered beforehand on the net. How might we use a text-based parser to present a story world that's not just about solving puzzles and overcoming obstacles, but it's just a space to wander, a space to navigate in. How can we use these technologies to generate other kinds of experience? And what my students invariably do is they take these technologies and they use them to tell stories about issues that matter to them such as their own personality, uh, their own life biographies. I've had students use these templates to talk about the Windrush generation. I've had students use these to talk about the environmental impacts of digital technology. They've been used for things other than, isn't this a cool piece of technology? They've instead used it to tell unusual stories in unusual formats and in the process reworking what they understand the technology is, what it's for, and most importantly, what it can be. And I think it's unlocking these potentials, different ways of seeing and thinking that is the most powerful tool that can be brought by STEAM-based approaches uh, to pedagogy and indeed research more broadly. My time is now up. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much indeed. So um, I posted Richard's website earlier, which uh, contains his current works and some of the things that he's been talking about. Um, and Richard does have a few papers um, on there as well and, and some work coming out. Um, so if you'd like to put those links in the chat, uh, Richard, that would be wonderful so we can see. Um, also, Richard does really amazing kind of, one, I, I just, this is just me because I'm a bit of a fan. Uh, <laughs> he uses a, a glider and drones to go over uh, landscapes to create the data for these generative waves. So it's waveform is the particular one that I'm talking about um, to, 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 to create generative poetry. Um, this is my shortcut version of his amazing research. <laughs> so, um, um, so please go and check out that out because it is absolutely really different way. It's the process as well, not just the kind of output. And, and you know, I'm just using this tool with this bit of data. It definitely is a convergence of, of tools, fields, and processes. So, so it's a, um, wonderful to, to see that. Um, and without further ado, we jump again to our next station with the wonderful Donna Comerford. Um, so Donna is a secondary ICT as well as computing teacher and postgraduate researcher at the University of Sussex. She's an educator in both formal and non-formal environments and a serial volunteer. I can vouch for that. Um, she's worked to bring low cost computing and creative fun to many children and young people, not just here in the UK, but around the world. Uh, Donna is focused on international development and education, especially around climate related disruption education. And she's interested in exploring the role of STEAM they play to limit the adverse impacts on low and middle income countries. So I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Donna. Oh, thank you so much, Genevieve. Yes. I was so 
excited to be invited to speak at this panel. I mean, this is an amazing panel and I'm overawed. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and run for 10 minutes. I'm coming from the very much the, the child and the community side of STEAM. So I've worked a lot with a lot of young people, a lot of families. Um, as Genevieve said, in formal classrooms, I've got 18 years teaching under my belt and lots of um, non-formal competitions, Young Rewired State. Um, I, I particularly feel the, the position that Karen's coming from with the children who are underrepresented in the digital industry and girls. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the things that I have um, done and one thing that I proposed between accepting this kind invitation and today. So uh, let me see whether or not this will change. Okay, now who is Nia? I'll tell you who Nia is near to the end of this presentation. Now, I was thinking about how important the STEAM label is to me. Um, as an educator, not very. I, I use it because it gives us some sort of standard. Um, when we say STEAM, people more or less know what we're talking about. It's a mixture of disciplines, as uh, Pam said, transdisciplinary. Um, the images that I've used here are from a project that I ran back in 2014, oh, I think. It was called Connective Culture, and it was where the burgeoning digital industry in Eastbourne, which is on the south coast of um, the UK, it's a, a very senior town, it's a retirement town, but there was a growing industry of digital people who'd moved out of London and were setting up co-working spaces. And they said, look, we would like to work with schools and young people. And the Arts Council and Arts Work, who are two, well, the Arts Council is a big sort of government funded body and Arts Work are a bridge organization that sit between the Arts Council and um, schools and other arts establishments. They gave us some money so we could run this project over, I think it was six months where we invited some local schools in Eastbourne to come and join us. And we worked with um, Phil Burrows, a local photographer, Seth Lee Delisle, who's an international artist, and David Blandy, another international artist. And they came and talked about their work and inspired the children and young people to make artworks. Uh, we said, we don't mind what you do, just use some sort of technology, and they did. Um, between sort of this invitation and uh, now, I presented an idea that I thought would match some of what I think are going to be the challenges for the next few years for us in education. Yes, STEAM and STEM, but I think the challenge will be about well-being. It will be about helping our young people to manage the disruption of the last two years. So I talked about pocket money gardens, and I see this very much as a, a transdisciplinary thing, a, a, the context. And I said, look, what I would like to see is on education campuses, and I would like to see this happening all over the globe, all over the world, that children, young people, teachers, trainee teachers, trainee social workers, um, students, and particularly for universities, international students who were caught on campus during the various lockdowns and couldn't travel, come together in communities to work on gardens that are designed by young gardeners. They, the plants are sourced, the, the earth is looked at and investigated, all the biosciences all mixed in there. And they create a, a diverse community that would support mental health and well-being. And I said, look, what I would like to see is that pocket money gardens, I don't mind what people call it, but it becomes a part of the teacher trainee programs. So each specialism, 
creates a bit of garden-based learning. I know Pam talked about a garden project. This is what I see as could be a strength, a real focus for that transdisciplinary work. So I've said, look, sciences, the mass garden areas, shapes, functional skills for older young people as well. So secondary school, my specialism is secondary school teaching. Um, art, creative, making, I love making. Um, but all of these things come together in the gardens. Um, I have, when I gave the presentation, I based it on Brighton. And I think that this will be the case across many, many communities where there are existing mental health issues, child services for mental health issues are, were overwhelmed before the pandemic. And I think this is a big issue now following on from school closures where young people didn't say goodbye to their teachers before they moved to schools. They then had to go somewhere new and fit in. And there are all sorts of issues around that. Um, creative resources uh, for some of the projects that I've worked on, I've used all of these things. Bath the Games design was, um, it was something I did with 11 year olds, 12 year olds and 13 year olds. And it's, it's supposed to be run over six weeks or six lessons. I actually let it run for three months. As a subject leader, I was able to do that. I could say, look, we are now going to do this because the children were so engaged. They would turn up in their break times to work on it. It was their project, their babies. They designed it all. They came and I taught them the very basics of scratch and they developed all the nitty gritty skills. And one team of four 11 year old girls churned out something that looked like Temple Run, yet they used resources from the Keep, which is an archive um, in Sussex. Um, the, the education officer came to school and talked with them. We talked with them on the telephone as well, so they shared information. All of these things, I could tick off their assessment. With vocational learning and looking at, um, for the Americans, it would be K-12, for us, it's year 12 and 13, international students learning um, the vocational courses rather than give them a paper-based exercise for events creation. We did the events. Um, the tiny, tiny image we've got here, an international student who said, I would like to make an event where I teach people about um, the blue porcelain for the life, willow pattern porcelain. Um, so I said, right, we've got to source the cups. So we sourced the cups. He had to balance the price that he would charge his fellow students. So I think it was something like two pounds to join the, work, the workshop. And then he gave a talk. Then they created the cups. Then the cups were displayed in the glass shop front um, of the school. So I said, this is, this is how I work. I want it to be real. I want them to have real skills when they go out into the world and to be able to compete with others. Um, Nia, I think I'm almost at time. So um, Nia, when you interact with Nia as educators, demonstrate your creativity and your enthusiasm with a lot of teaching um, in a formal environment, that enthusiasm is lost because of everything that is demanded of you, the paperwork, the bureaucracy, all of that. And sometimes that gets lost. If you reach out into your networks, into your community and across into industry, you'll get that enthusiasm back. Those people will, will feed your soul for teaching and you bring those skills back to your children and young people. Um, Nia, Nia is me. She is every black girl every diverse young person in your care take care of them infuse them and help them to enjoy their time at school thank you very much for listening i'm gonna unshare now
Thanks, Donna. That was awesome. Um, so good. And it's so true about keeping it real and also about this industry blending. Um, so there is uh, Skype in the classroom, so you can bypass the DBS, which is a challenge for a lot of people. <laughs> um, if you need speakers, do it virtually. Um, less paperwork. Uh, is always good, um, but it is super challenging to to bring that in. Um, when I was a teacher in Brighton, I did a huge large scale hack event. We had every year ten in the whole of Brighton come. Uh, my 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 year thirteen students were um, were the moderators around. We had people from the Department of Education. Uh, Raspberry Pi had just brought out the Raspberry Pi. Um, you name it, every man. And it was when we had amazing speakers. We had Aral Balkan uh, come and do the keynote. Um, and the students just loved it. The fact that they were given the opportunity, we had um, keynotes uh, sky, um, call in from um, the US. Um, and it was about that idea of them still taking the same things that they were doing in the classroom, but actually making it with other students, which you don't normally get to do, even though you're still teaching. You're siloed in your own computing classroom. You don't get to share that knowledge with um, other teachers and actually share the load. Um, so yeah, so awesome. Keeping it real, Donna, uh, as somebody said in the chat, which I thought was brilliant. And finally, but definitely not least, is the wonderful Luciana Hale. Um, and we're just going to introduce her before she uh, kicks off. Um, so Luciana is an artist, research and lecturer uh, for uh, Brighton University, the MA Digital Media Arts course. And Luciana's work explores the altered states of consciousness and focuses on sleep, lucid dreaming, memory, hauntology and nostalgia. Um, and it's really exciting. And what interested me is that um, uh, Luciana uses brainwaves for some of her work and she's going to share some stuff now. Uh, Luciana, over to you. Hello, my name is Luciana Hale. I'm an artist and researcher. Here are some of the conferences and shows where my art and publications have appeared in the last few years. You can probably see that there's a good mix between computer science and the arts, both in the public and academic sectors, with some high-tech psychedelic uh, events in both European and international locations. This artist is really important to me. This is Brian Giesen, a prophet of multimedia. His artwork fused neuroscience in the 1960s when he created the dream machine, which he sat in front of in this photo. And he decided it's the first art object to be seen with the eyes closed. You get an effect from a flickering light glimpse through a cardboard cylinder that's spinning on top of a record player. He thought it would ultimately replace television in all homes. Um, so you experience these kind of shadow patterns that create a strange effect on your mind, slightly relaxing. It's a rhythm that entrains your brain into a more meditative state. Now until Geissen's dream machine, the flicker phenomena was purely a scientific technique used to research into epilepsy to help reduce uh, seizures and better understand the effects of mescaline. In this photo on the right is Dr. Gray Water. He was based in Burden in Bristol and he was a world leader in EEG research. He went on to discover theta and delta brain waves and described them in a very accessible book called The Living Brain in the early 60s. And when Geissen got hold of this, it really gave validation to his dream machine. So here I am with a dream machine in the Royal Academy. I'm applying a brainwave interface to the frontal lobes of one of the audience so she can experience my artwork. She has her eyes closed. Now, of course, there's a consent form to read over because your brainwave activity may well be altered via photic stimulation of the dream machine. And we will all be watching her brainwaves projected across the room. So some of the other effects are time passes somewhat faster, relaxation can be quite rejuvenating and unexpected ideas emerge. These are the sort of things we hear afterwards from the audience as the flicker entrains the brain into slower alpha and theta waves. Also the um, effects of the visuals uh, can be described as entoptic, coming from the Greek word for within vision happening somewhere between the eye itself and the neural cortex. 
form constants, shadow patterns, hexagons, Catherine wheels, these are the sort of things that are perceived. Um, so we also conduct post uh, art experience verbal interviews with my assistant and these forms were designed in the psychological lab to help receive the information without prompting to find out what the audience have felt. Um, this is my current work which I'll be showing you very shortly from inside the Geniemo software. It's a series of live streams. I call it this Into the Rose Garden inspired by T.S. Eliot's Burnt Norton from the Four Quartets and it's exploring an alternate reality. Uh, the Rose Garden for me is cyberspace focusing on things which might have been but never were. For instance, from Eliot, the passage not taken, the door never opened. Here's the technology we're using. The software is Genimo. It's free software developed for the PC. It's a volumetric real-time communication tool that's based on LiveScan 3D. And the hardware is almost under a thousand pounds. It involves a Kinect 4 camera which enables me to capture 360 degrees with the LiDAR sensor emitting a single short laser pulse and it also creates a four-dimensional point cloud image from a static position on a tripod. So overall this is a very democratic way of creating um, you know, quite advanced artworks and in July I delivered a paper co-authored with Dr. Nick Lampert called Synthesis Making Magic with Jeannie Mo at the EVA 21 conference and here I was within my brainwave feedback which hopefully I'll show you soon and uh, showing you can I create a better sense of trust or intimacy when you meet within a live stream and with brainwaves um, so this video there are links to how I developed making music as well playing compositions and I will be posting these in the chat as well. There's also the paper. And now I'm going to ask the host to please play a very short video actually showing you the, the visualizations from the software I use, which is called IBVA, Interactive Brainwave Visual Analyzer. And you can see on the x axis the delta, theta, alpha, and beta waves, and so on. And you'll see that within this very short clip during a, dream, a flickering light, you start to see the entrainment, the peaks come closer together, somebody's entering a state which is very trance-like. So once we've watched a very short video, we will join me in a social cast of Ginny Mo. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to pre-record that so I kept to time and didn't miss anything out essential, which I'm kind of prone to doing from my experience. So it's wonderful to be involved and uh, it's very appropriate for me too, because as an artist, all my work is informed through science. So we take the dream machine. I learned so much about neuro neuroscience when I understood how in the 60s, early 60s, Geisen wanted to make a drugless high, a transcendental art object for everyone to experience really strange altered states. So let's move on sort of 30 years and here I am working with a four dimensional volumetric capture system. The software is called Genimo and I've been using this for about nine months. And what we've been exploring through the paper and the research and the art is can we improve um, empathy, communication, telepresent art, experiences and potentially obviously from what we're talking here teaching so I'm leaving it kind of open-ended when I show you some brain waves think about if you were communicating with a student through a, a lesson plan delivered via zoom would this help improve or add anything if you could see if they were stressed if you could see if they were relaxing more but first of all I'm just applying the EEG headband that you've seen in so many pictures if you look at my work 
it's an IBVA system, frontal lobes. So you'll see if I'm concentrating or relaxing, for instance. Um, I'm using some software here, which I'll, shows you, as you saw just now, the waves up to 60 hertz. So immediately, if I was stressed or very nervous, there would be a lot of beta activity spiking, you know, really strong signals in the fast waves. Now at the moment, perversely, artistically, I've rotated the axes and everything's moving. So it's not a linear analytical kind of display that a scientist or therapist would be used to. But this is how I work. And um, I'm trying to provoke people all the time to kind of engage and you know, suggest things. So in the last year, it's been hard to work in a normal environment with the public. So I've been online. I created a VJ self. It's like a DJ for visuals called Token Girl. And um, I've been exploring how to make my art more telematic. So I can't apply the brainwave data, um, interface to anyone else. I can only show my own. So in the last year, I've been playing a lot of compositions. I've been playing the theme tune to This Is Your Life from the 1970s program, which is um, it's, it's quite ominous, but it's also very relaxing once you get into it. And I've been playing it on bass and recording my brainwaves whilst I do that, streaming it. Of course, artistically, I research everything neuroscientifically and from the pioneers in electronic art from the 60s, such as Alan Capral, who wanted to create a TV arcade where people could experience themselves on multiple screens. And Nam Jun Peck, who had a fantastic show at Tate Modern just before uh, the lockdown in March, which showed his multiple video global disco, early global superhighway ideas to the public. So what I love about Jeannie Mo is, um, okay, it's quite cost effective, it's amazing. So it democratizes many more people to better access a high level of technology. Um, it's not owned by any particular like massive companies, say Oculus and Facebook, there's no connection. And my colleagues have made the software and all the links will be posted if you want to use it. Anyone's on the PC at the moment, but the LiDAR lens, the Connect 4, there is also LiDAR lens in the latest iPad Pro Max, which is a high cost device, but it may enable us, the, the technology to have a wider audience. So I've been looking at how to use this in different ways. So we, we explored um, therapy and of course I'm quite distorted. We call it voxelated. So the point cloud that's being created right now, it's using uh, the, the laser to emit a pulse it's detecting me, I can, for instance, rotate it. I'm not moving, the camera's on a tripod, obviously. It gets quite creepy. So I don't think it'd be very good for a lot of therapies because visually you get incredibly distorted. But uh, in a way of abstracting data and experiencing over time, something important, something intimate, maybe, something that's not normally shared between two people. Um, do you feel, or could you feel, if I meditated now and I showed you some really deeply different waves, this is a dream machine pattern, would you have a deeper connection? Would we improve how we feel and relate to each other over time? So these are the sort of things artistically I'm always exploring and look obviously to all the psychological studies to, to uh, validate this. So Into the Rose Garden is in progress and I will be making a new chapter soon. Um, to add to the live streams because it only occurs through the network. There is no piece, there is no you know, physical performance, although I have created pieces for Mozilla Festival in May and Hackstock uh, late last year. Um, so I was really inspired by Bernd Norton by T.S. Eliot because it's obviously all about time in that chapter. Um, time passing and is time irredeemable and spending a lot of time, you know, as we all have uh, as in our homes, not interacting so much has been so influential. So I use test cards as well in the image because test cards are kind of traditionally an image that happens when no thing is happening, no program is being broadcast. So the, the aesthetic of the test card, particularly the, the all TF channel from France in the 70s became uh, something that I've developed. Obviously a lot of Marshall McLuhan influences me and writings from um, neuroscience and musicians. So I just want to provoke you. If you've not seen the musician, Charlotte Mormon playing 
uh, a cello for Nan June Peck in the, in the 70s, wearing a bra, a brassiere that is um, two TV monitors. So very, you know, ancient technology, but so pioneering, giving feedback of the performance. Um, I suggest you look at it or I'll post the link. And uh, I look forward to some interesting questions because I often miss out the obvious things. That's why I did, delivered the facts first. And I hope that this has been food for thought and how art, neuroscience and everything I've interconnected, having trained as an artist. I was, you know, I did a degree, but I didn't need to do that really to do the things I'm doing. But of course, I've had many interesting connections through you know, the wonderful hosts, events, shows that I showed in the first slide. So thank you for listening to me and I would love to um, join everyone in, the, in your chat and be able to communicate. Brilliant. Thank Thanks you. Luciana. <laughs> um, I'm just going to share my brainwaves for you for a second because somebody had an interesting question about the sort of privacy um, and uh, hidden nature of data issues. So this is my brainwave data recorded using oh. the emotive headset. And to show you that you can't see your brainwaves, it's one of the reasons why I absolutely love Luciana's work. Yeah, I um, the brain, so pain from the I know. <laughs> Um, but actually, one of the reasons why I'm doing it is a question that Cynthia has just asked, and that is in relation to privacy. And this is a huge issue in education and specifically with schools. There is some studies um, which can get some data that do it with primary and up to K-12. They're mainly coming out of China, um, again, which holds some other issues um, um, again. But it is a very... Um, specific issue when we're talking about biometric data of students and it's important that we do understand what this data thank you kevin uh, <laughs> um beat me to it in the chat <laughs> um it's really important that we understand the data and it's one of the reasons why um, I'm showing my brainwave data so they can explore it and I just export it as a, as a spreadsheet. So once I finish my PhD, there'll be a massive data set of, of my brainwaves um, <laughs> dancing um, so that you can then explore it and turn it into different things. So we're turning it into music with Sonic Pi. Um, we're also using the brainwave data for, de um, for uh, generative backgrounds in the augmented reality. Uh, that we're creating. Um, so the, it, it, it's about that. It's about when you share somebody else's data as well. Is it like, you know, what is the difference between you and your data self, especially in a STEAM environment? And then when you pull that into a classroom environment, the massive challenges that educators face, because not only do they have to have all of the sort of logistics and, and, and legalities in place, they have to have assessment. And I'm going to pose a question to Donna, being our wonderful educator first, as we kick this off. And um, there's a sort of common narrative um, that we that, you know, this is, um, you know, people may think that educators uh, make decisions on what they teach in curriculum based on, you know, what are the ma to maximize the outcomes of their learners. And what, what we want to do is how can we ensure they get those grades that obviously are important to them and are also important to educators. Um, and, and what does our understanding of have steam um, in relation to the impact on that? And this, I'm just going to open up to Donna first, but feel free for everyone else to jump in, jump in in the chat. And again, audience members, feel free to jump in uh, with your ideas as well. So Donna, sorry to hit you first with those questions, darling. <laughs> Fire away. That's okay, thanks, Jen. Um, thank you to whoever posed this question. Um, during my presentation, I did mention about um, Buster Games design and how I just let that run on. Now, that was a prime example for me of something that, yes, the, the design, communication, um, sharing information were all um, assessment criteria that the children had to, had to meet for something like the level fours and fives of their assessment at the time. And I, I don't like to do anything that's a bit dull. So in my classrooms, Yes, we have to meet the assessment criteria, but let's build it into whatever tasks that the young people are going to engage with. So they engaged with Back the Games design, and all I did was map 
their assessment criteria to what they were doing. Some, at some stage, they needed to create spreadsheets. Okay, let's add a marketing element to Basta Games Design. Let's see if we can create a spreadsheet that will show how much we need to pay for advertising. All of those sort of assessment dull tasks, map it to something that they are engaged with. And as I said, with the vocational learning, make it real. Do not allow your students just to do paper, ex they, they don't like that, it's not engaging, and it doesn't equip them to meet the world, it doesn't equip them to help them go out and be fully formed human beings. <laughs> I hope that's answered the question for um, whoever answered. Yep, yeah, sorry, I just kicked and knocked over my coffee. <laughs> um, I'm too excited with the response to the questions. Um, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time, but what I would like us to do is to continue our conversations either on Twitter or feel free to get back in touch with, um, with Defi um, on any of our platforms. First of all, I would like to thank all of our speakers. So Pam, Karen, Richard, Donna, Luciana, and actually I would love to thank, which don't normally get thanked, but that is Barry and Jude, who are the, the, the back tech of Defi this evening. And I'd really like to thank them. I'd also like to thank Arm for sponsoring this and all of you for joining in on our wonderful um, presentation seminars and, and provocative conversations this evening. Have a wonderful Thursday evening and thank you everybody. Bye guys.